Thank you for letting me be here with you guys. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on how I came to be here. Like uh, Colton introduced me, my name is Sean Yowsey. My best friend is Chad Johnson, who a lot of you are very familiar with. So, yeah, we all like Chad. So let me tell you how Chad and I met, because there are several different instances. So imagine yourself back in 2005, I think, Chad. 2005, we were in the same student building at Snow College down in Ephraim, Utah. We knew who each other were, but never talked. Then we ended up serving LDS missions together, pointed each other out, became friends. We actually ended up serving as companions on our mission. And then after that, we uh, were roommates two separate times, best men in each other's wedding. And all the way here, it's culminated with this UVU Master Series. How about that? Is it pretty exciting? So I'm grateful to Chad for uh, inviting me to be here. I'm really grateful to the university and allowing us to be here and to talk with you guys who are passionate about things that I'm passionate about. Uh, my business partner at Redbird Consultants, his name is Sean Ray, same first name. He's in California right now. He's not able to be here, but I'm grateful for him. He's put together a lot of the slide decks, the material that you have in front of you that we're going to be using today. So just as an introduction, this is going to be a little bit of an interactive activity. Okay? I want you to leave with something that you can use that works for you and that you can apply as students and also apply in your future leadership roles, whether that's in a current role or also down the road. So we're gonna, I'm going to learn from you while we're all said and done when this is, uh, this is going on. So I'm looking forward to talking with you as we get started. Additionally, at the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers. If you want to talk to me afterwards, we also have an email that you can get in touch with myself. You'll have Chad, obviously, and then uh, my business partner, Sean. You can get in touch with us through email as we talk about these things. So as we get started, uh, you already know a little bit about me and about my family and, uh, and things like that. That's what's most important to me. My family is most important. Uh, I work to support them, and also I get some, some satisfaction out of that. And I also love sports uh, for reasons that I'll show you here hereafter. But as we get started, as we talk with you who are interested in leadership, I'm fascinated with leadership, not so much because you can make more money, which you can, but because you are also because you get to incorporate your ideas, which you also can do. But leadership, I really believe, is the way that you make the world a better place. If you look at any changes that have happened for the better over history, there is a strong leader or leaders behind it. And I'm really, really excited that you guys are passionate about those things and that you're looking to make a difference. So today, we call this at Redbird Consultants the <laughs> process-driven leader. And the reason we call it process-driven is because there are a couple of things we don't do. We're not strategy people. We don't know exactly how you should incorporate a strategy, what metrics you should set, or even how you should coach your people if you are in a leadership or manager role. That's not our thing. Also, we don't believe in silver bullets. So I don't believe that you can read a book, go to a lecture, or see a YouTube video and all of a sudden have it all figured out. If it was that easy, we'd all have it figured out by now, right? And if that was that easy in school, you wouldn't have to go to class. There are processes that we follow that help us develop results. So Sean and I, when we started the business, we said, you know what, we're process guys. We believe that leaders, individuals, teammates, coaches, whatever it is that you're working on or trying to accomplish can solve problems through disciplined processes. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is the process-driven leader, taking principles that have been proven timeless again and again and actually applying it to what you're doing. So let's get started with an activity. All of you have a sheet, right? You got the sheet in front of you? So we're going to start on the worksheet side where you can actually fill things in. We'll go to the agenda in a little bit. So if you pull that up, I'm going to have you do something at the top of the page. And I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do it. I want you to identify the name of an individual who you think is a successful leader. And two to three different characteristics or things that leader did that points to why he or she was successful. So I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do that. The name of the leader, as well as two to three different things that made that leader successful. Starting now. Have at it. You can talk amongst yourselves. We'll bring it back here in approximately 53 seconds now. All right, let's bring it all back together. So if you finish writing, you can finish up your note, whatever it is. But I, I'm interested in what you wrote down, who you wrote down. Do I have any volunteers who want to share who they wrote down? Yeah, go ahead. So I wrote down my high school water polo team. I love it. What's his name? Reed Rosenberg. OK, tell us a little bit about Reed. Reed, the, my 
you know, he backed up with his actions, with his words and deeds. And then he also was very, he wanted the best for each, each teammate. Yeah. He thought of them on equal ground, like he wasn't better than them, but he wanted to progress as a team. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. So Reed made a, made a point in your memory about being a good leader. I love that. Who else? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a friend, her name's Carissa, and she was the president. Um, I'm religious, so in the LDS, um, she was the president of the Young Women's um, Organization. Cool. And you were a young woman at that time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. So what made her great in your mind? Why did you think of her today? Um, it was because she showed a lot of empathy to other, towards others, and she cares about everybody. Like, everybody, like, she's cool, not so cool, kind of, you know. And um, he's, she's very strong with her values, and um, she teaches both my word and action, and she just never... Nice. That, so. Love that. Thank you for sharing. Word and action. Setting example, right? See some common themes here. Let's get one more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so mine's like more of like a big wave person that everyone knows. Cool. Washington. Like if you don't know who that is, you have to go to school. <laughs> but we're Washington and we have this like big wave that everyone knows. Um, Yeah. Leading by example too. Um, also, he, he had high expectations of those around him. Like he saw their potential and like knew what they could do, and he expected that from them and would build them up in a way that they could accomplish that. And also, he um, he would acknowledge that he was human. He didn't try to make himself seem like this big, powerful person. Like he was like, no, like I'm I'm human, just like you, type of thing. And yeah. I love that. So same thing, worked by example, right? I like the idea that he acknowledges that he doesn't have the answers to everything, right? Which we'll also talk about. The leader doesn't have to have the answers to everything, but the leader uses principles and processes to arrive at the right choices. Thank you so much for sharing that. And whoever you wrote down, I'm sure you all have examples that are similar, maybe a little bit different from personal or public life. But we're gonna come back to these. As we think about these types of things, the leader has two jobs when it's all said and done. A leader does two things and two things only, no matter what role they're in. The first job of a leader is to clarify a vision or an objective, right? Clarify a vision. And the second job is to actually execute that vision, which is much harder. So we're going to talk about a couple of these things today. First of all, clarifying a vision. What does it mean to clarify? If you had to define it on the spot, somebody give me a shout out. What does clarity look like? Make it simple. Make it simple. I love that. Very simple. That's, actually, that's fantastic. Make it simple. What else? How else would you describe it? Specific. Simple and specific. Why, is, why are those two things important, simple and specific? Well, if it's not specific and you're just like, well, I just want everyone to get along, and you're like, well, what does that look like in your mind? Yeah, because we are different human beings, right? either my leader or who I lead, can view things differently. That's perfect. We keep it simple. We keep it specific. Now we talk about executing vision. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say it's like a SMART goal, sort of. It has to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. Yeah. So that everybody can understand it. Everybody knows what their place and position is. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There's no ambiguity, right? Yeah, go ahead. It probably has deliverables and to-dos. That's right. Action. Tasks and results. Right? We know if I'm climbing a mountain, I got to know what the top of the mountain looks like. Right? I love it. Excellent. So clarity. We got to be clear. We got to be specific. We got to be simple. We got to have deliverables. We got to make sure that we know how our efforts are going to apply to the objective. Right? So second, the job of a leader is to execute a vision. What is business execution? What is that? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how to execute leadership and different standards. Um, you know, there's different standards for different workplaces. Um, how you can be consistent with those standards. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you've got to have some kind of standard that you're actually going to achieve, right? I love that. Did you have some as well? I was just going to say the follow through. Yeah. The follow through is huge, right? Remember, you're talking about these leaders from your personal lives or George Washington from public life or any business leader that's successful. They're able to crystallize a clear vision. They provide a clarified vision, whether that's a free country 
whether that's winning a water polo game, whether that's improving your life as a teenage girl, right? And then through their behaviors and actions, they're able to make that a reality through their ability to get in the pool with you, show up to the meetings with you, lead the battle from the front of the lines, whatever that looks like, right? So the role of a leader is to clarify a vision and execute a vision. So as we get started here, think about this. Um, some of you may have seen this. We call these proverbs because they're timeless, right? Where there is no vision, the people perish. So that's an old proverb from the Old Testament, but we've seen it a, a variety of different places. Has anybody seen a team or organization that you would say, oh yeah, that, that place or that company, that vision doesn't exist? Has anybody seen that? What does that look like? Cool. And yeah, it was a really cool idea. And it could have been executed really well, but there were two leaders and they just butted heads all the time. And one would yeah. say one thing and then another would say another. And so as youth leaders in an organization, we didn't know who to listen to, what to do. And so we did nothing. And so I just withdrew from the organization, did nothing for it. And all of the youth leaders did. And so it just collapsed and it fell apart. And so we were never able to make that change a reality. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And think about uh, that's probably similar of other experiences as well, right? as you're thinking about this fact. If there's no vision, the people perish. In this case, a great opportunity, great goals, lots of talent comes to nothing because nobody knows what to work on, right? What other characteristics are there of an organization or team or political group that has no vision? What do you see? Yeah, go ahead. Huge. Yeah, that's the danger of having a strategy without a vision, right? You lose track of people and real results for the sake of trying to meet a quota or something else, right? Thank you for sharing that. So the goal today, right, we're not, you're not going to be those types of leaders. You've seen them. You've seen those teams. You're not going to be that type of person. And it takes effort and practice, but there are processes for developing these things. So as we get started and, uh, and get this started up here, I'm going to tell you a story. Everybody likes stories. Are there any finance majors here? Anybody majoring in finance? Got some finance majors? All right. So I, uh, I've worked in the financial industry, uh, and, and I'm really fascinated with these types of stories. So in finance, you learn about the market, stock markets, delivering IPOs, things like that, right? So let me take you back 30 years ago to 1987. So 1987, in a room not unlike this, except it happens to be a conference room at a Marriott Hotel in New York City, there's a gathering of about the same amount of people here. And in that group you have stock analysts, wealthy investors, as well as news reporters. And the reason they're all gathered here 30 years ago is because the company, Alcoa, is going to introduce a new chief executive office, officer, a CEO. He's going to be introduced to the company for the, or to the company in the world for the first time. So those of you that are in finance, you know that the CEO's job is to drive stock market results for the company, right? to drive deliverables for the company. So naturally, people that have a lot of money tied up in the stock market are here to see this. Does anybody know off the top of their head what the company Alcoa produces or does? Steel. Yeah, they're a steel and aluminum company. So everything from spacecraft, knickknacks around your house like on windowsills, all the way to Hershey's wrappers. So they do all these types of things. It's a huge company and they've been struggling for about 15 years to gain market share in a very competitive industry. So they're introducing a new chief exec executive officer, officer named Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill comes from the government, not necessarily who you would peg first choice to run a Fortune 500 company. But he's running this new company and he's introducing himself for the first time. So he comes up, similar to like I am now, there's a podium up in front and he's got a prepared statement. And this is what he says. He says, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. I want to talk to you about worker safety. Every year, hundreds of Alcoa employees lose time on the job because of workplace injury. Now, if you're a stock market analyst, if you're an investor that's got all your money riding on this guy, that's probably not the introduction you're thinking, right? You're expecting to think about other things. 
And sooner or later, the conference starts to go that way. So a reporter asks a question, so you have this organization within your company that's been floundering. Are you going to sell it? Are you going to reorganize the leadership, restructure it? What are you going to do? And Paul O'Neill says, I don't know if you heard me. My job at Alcoa is to make Alcoa the safest place to work in America. I aim to go for zero injuries, which for a steel company is absurd, right? So you can imagine everybody's antsy at this point. They've got this guy in charge who's talking about worker safety, seems to have no knowledge about profit and loss and which parts of the business are going well, yet he's tasked with running billions of dollars of market capital. So at this, as this conference comes to an end, it's about one hour, the analysts book it out of the room. They're the first ones out. They're elbowing people to get out of the room. One analyst, they're running to pay phones. Nobody has cell phones or, or things like that. They're running to pay phones. And one analyst gets to a pay phone first, and he's, his job is to call his five wealthiest investors that have Alcoa stock. That's why he's in the room in the first place. So he makes dials as fast as he can. And this is the message he delivers. He says, hey, they've got a hippie in charge of the company. Sell what you got right now before the company tanks. Sell it before these other analysts tell their investors to sell it. Otherwise, you're going to lose your shirt. 20 years later, after this meeting, this analyst is being interviewed, and he says, that was the worst mistake of my financial career in giving that advice. And we're going to come back to Paul O'Neill and Alcoa in just a moment. So let's start with the first job of a leader, which is to clarify a vision. Some of you may be familiar with Simon Sinek and his work, Start With Why. Has anybody heard that book, seen that lecture on YouTube? It's most, one of the most popular TED Talks, right? So Simon Sinek argues that true effectiveness comes from individuals and teams who start with why as opposed to what. They start with why they're in business in the first place, why they're working on things in the first place, instead of what is it I'm doing and how am I doing it. So if we're thinking about this from a clarifying vision standpoint, Let's go back to Paul O'Neill and Alcoa. What's his why? If you're thinking about it. Say that louder. Worker safety. Close. It's worker safety, but think about it in more concrete terms. What did he say his goal was as the chief executive officer of Alcoa? Zero injuries at the work. Yeah. So worker safety, and we know we've, re we've met it, if we're the safest place to work in America with zero workplace injuries. Right? So he is crystallizing a vision that everybody that he is responsible for, from the executives in the suite, all the way down to the janitor who cleans up the manufacturing plants at night, knows, understands, and lives, right? So he's starting with why. How he actually accomplishes that and what he does to accomplish that doesn't matter. That's strategy. We'll talk about that, right? But he has a vision as he's talking about these types of things. So similarly, as a leader, your job is to clarify that one thing that you need to be responsible for, that you want your direct reports, your team, your organization to live and breathe. Not even when they just walk in the building, but you want this to be part of who your people are. It's culture, right? That's who you want your people to be. At the top of your, of your worksheet, you'll see that there's a section called the one thing. And we're going to practice this in just a moment, but you're going to practice with the one thing and, uh, and work on that. And let me give you kind of, a, kind of a disclaimer. When it comes to the one thing, this why, or everything else that we're working on to crystallize a vision and clarify a vision, bear in mind this doesn't happen all at once, right? This is something that changes over time and that you work on and practice and think about. So for example, at Redbird Consultants, my business partner and I, our why is to help people develop systems and processes that drive success, whatever that success looks like to them. And that's something we've practiced over time. We've thought in the past, well, we like business. Business is pretty cool. So how can we go into business with liking business? We thought, well, we like to teach. We like reading good books that have good principles that people can apply. And over time, as we talk about these things, as we practice and as we iterate them over and over again, we arrived at something that works for us where we say, that's who we want to be. That's how we're going to make decisions. We develop systems and processes that help people drive success. If we have opportunities outside of that, not interested. Everything else falls in this funnel. So here's what I'm going to do. And again, I encourage you to talk with each other. I think we get a lot of clarity 
when we're bouncing ideas off of one another. I'm going to give you two full minutes in this round to write down something that you believe is your why or your one thing. And again, don't feel like uh, you have to have it all figured out right now. You probably have a pretty good inkling of why it is you do what you do. The fact that you're here today and you planned appropriately suggests a lot. So starting now, I'm going to give you two minutes. Go ahead and talk with each other. Write down on the left-hand side of that section the one thing and, uh, and go ahead and incorporate that. All right. Let's do this. So thanks to Ryan. Ryan gave me a microphone so we can hear you a little bit better as we're sharing these things. Does anybody care to share their one thing or their why they've come up with? Okay, we'll start here. I said to teach, strengthen, and bless others so that they can live happy and successful lives. Perfect. Repeat that one more time for us. To teach, strengthen, and bless others so that they can live happy and successful lives. Nice. Isn't that better than simply to reach my quota every year so I don't get fired? Isn't that better? <laughs> Thank you very much. What else? Who else would like to share? Um, my one thing is to give back to the world what I've been given because I want to do humanitarian work when I'm older. Very cool. Yes. I love it. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? Anybody else? All right. We'll do one more. Um, I said better me and a better life. So. I like it. I like it. Thank you so much. So you can see these whys that you're coming up with. Those are a lot more than simply what do I major in? What am I going to do for a job? Where am I going to live? Right? There's more to it that connects with the human spirit than simply, yeah, this is what I'm going to do, right? And that's the role of a leader, is to clarify these things. If you are a manager or your job is to lead other people, you need to know what your direct reports and your responsibilities are as, a, as the why goes, or those, what those, those whys are for the people that report to you. That's your responsibility. You need to know that and be accountable for it. This is where business becomes very human. Whether you're working in a Fortune 500 company, whether you're working in the public sector, in government, education, whether you're working in humanitarian work, whether you're a stay-at-home mom like my wife is, whatever it is that you're doing, this is where it all comes down to humanity, right? It's not about profit and loss, so that's important for a company. It's not about the amount of students that attend or the amount of sales achieved. This is about how people are living better lives. So at this point, you've clarified a portion of your personal vision. You've clarified what it is that you really want to be working towards, right? So now let's talk about the second step as we go into this. So my dad and my brothers and I, I've got three little brothers, we are huge sports fans. I mentioned I like the Utah Jazz. I love the Magpies, Tottenham Hotspur. That's my, uh, that's my EPL team. I'm a recent convert there. I love it. So we love sports, and we follow college football and pro basketball very closely, even the offseason when coaches are hired and fired. And I remember this very distinctly from my dad. So we were watching, uh, or on the internet or something, I saw a football coach that was hired, and he had a press conference. And this football coach clarified a vision. Let me tell you what. He clarified a vision. He talked about the type of assistant coaches he hired and why. He talked about the type of student athletes he was going to recruit and why that would lead to success on the field. He talked about the type of contribution his football team is going to make to the university and to the community. He had it down. And I, I was impressed. I was impressed. And I told my dad, like, hey, did you see so-and-so's press conference at such and such university? I think they got the right guy. And my dad said something to me that I'll never forget. And it's this quote right behind you. He says, you know, that's great, but nobody gets remembered for press conferences. They don't hand out trophies for the press release. So you can clarify a vision, you can talk a big game, but if you can't bring that vision to reality, in a sports sense, bringing wins on the field, then you're just going to get fired like the guy before you that couldn't clarify a vision, right? So the second job of a leader, not the first, but the second job of a leader, is to actually execute that vision. And we're going to talk about the processes you can use as a leader once you've identified your why to put that into practice, to achieve that goal. One word of warning as we get to this transition, it's going to be tempting to put strategy in front of vision when you get out into the workplace, and even in school, right? 
As soon as you come through the doorways of a class, as soon as you get hired onto a job, immediately you have a set of tasks that you need to accomplish. You have things you need to remember and practice and apply. You essentially have your workday planned out for you in a lot of cases. Essentially, they're giving you strategy for you to accomplish, right? And that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. But keep in mind, strategy is much easier to get lost in than your vision. And the strategy cannot come before your vision. Remember that. Your strategy cannot come before the vision. Stephen Covey, who uh, had a lot of presence here, has a, a quote that I'm paraphrasing that I just love. And he said essentially, climbing the corporate ladder is great, assuming that the ladder is uh, leaning against the right wall. Your vision is the wall. That's where you know you're climbing the right mountain, you're climbing the right ladder, you're working on the right things. The strategy is how you actually climb that ladder or climb that mountain. That's where we execute. You can be an execution star when it comes to business, but if you're not accomplishing goals that matter, then all you've done is accomplish goals that don't matter. And you never get remembered for it. And you never make a positive impact the way that you could have. So remember, nobody gets remembered for the press conference. The actual why, the vision, that you've put down is simple, but actually putting it into practice and realizing it is a little bit more difficult, right? So there are a couple of different components to executing your why. At Redbird, we call the why your one thing. There are a lot of different components to this. Component number one is your one thing. Taking what you have determined to be your why and putting that into goal format with deliverables so you know whether that's a smart goal or anything like that, you know whether or not you're making progress towards your why. So you're focusing on the one thing in goal format. Number two is focusing on lead measures. These are behaviors that you yourself control that will impact your one thing and get you closer to your objectives. And finally, you participate in a cycle of ruthless accountability. And we'll talk more about this. Ruthless does not mean mean-spirited, condescending, or vindictive, right? Ruthless just means that there are no excuses. There's nowhere to hide. If I'm on this team, I contribute. If I'm not contributing, I don't need to be participating on this team, whatever that looks like, right? So ruthless accountability simply just means I show up and I deliver on what the team needs me to do to achieve our one thing. And we're gonna talk about each of these in depth. So first of all, let's explore a little bit more the one thing and take that to goal format. So some of you had, had given your, your why. There was humanitarian work. Better you, right? You wanna be better you, better people around us. We have those different things that we want to actually accomplish. But that's difficult to know whether or not you've actually done it, right? You can have these pie in the sky attitudes and these pie in the sky goals, but if it's not deliverable, you'll never know if you achieved it or not. And that's dangerous, right? It's very dangerous to be in that situation. So here's the way around that. There's a great book I recommend to all of you from Franklin Covey called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And they run these execution models on things that you work on to deliver on goals that you've set for an organization or yourself. And we're gonna apply those today. The way that you do this is through a simple framework called from X to Y by when. And in layman's terms, that just means from where I am right now or where our team is right now to where we want to be that characterizes our why by a certain date, right? That's what we want to focus on. That's where we want to be. That's what we want to be putting our efforts into. So to give you a simple example, think about somebody trying to lose weight. If somebody's why is, I want to be around for my grandkids. I want to take my kids to school. I want to wrestle with my grandkids. I want to go on vacations with my wife when I, or my husband when I retire. At the forefront of that, they've got to be healthy to do that. So they say, I'm going to put a goal into place that crystallizes my why. I want to go from 250 pounds down to 200 pounds by October 2018. That's their X to Y by when. That's how they take their why, what they're really trying to accomplish, and put it into a deliverable that they can say, yes, I'm on the right track, or no, I'm missing something, right? So going back to Alcoa Steel, Paul O'Neill and his group started off, and he says, I want to be the safest place to work in America. 
We care about worker safety. That's the vision, right? Well, good for you. Other than a survey of every single organization in the United States, how does he know if he's actually accomplishing that, right? So let me give you a statistic. On the day Paul O'Neill started, there were 1.86 lost work days per 100 workers at Alcoa, which doesn't sound like a ton if you're factoring in a room like this, right? But when you figure that Alcoa is a Fortune 500 company, has thousands of employees, think of the lost work time. Think of how many people are hurting or in pain because of Alcoa processes. Think of how much money the company is spending for health insurance rates that are skyrocketing, for paid time off for people that are recovering due to workplace injuries. You see how this all comes together? His goal was to go from 1.86 lost work days per 100 people to zero lost work days within five years. That's the goal, right? That's how he takes his why to be the safest place to work in America and puts it into action and says, this is how we're going to do it. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to give you now two more minutes and talk with each other. Take your why, put it into a goal format that you can actually deliver and execute on. From X to Y by when. I'm going to give you two minutes starting now to do this, and then we'll have, uh, I'll have one or two of you share in just a moment. So have at it. Two minutes starting now. All right. Now this is where it gets a little bit more sensitive. I know we're sharing goals and things like that. Is there anybody that cares to explain to us your why and the one thing goal that you've set from X to Y by when? Is anybody interested in sharing that? Yeah. Okay, Thank you. so my one thing is to help people help people. So I like helping other people know how to serve. So I actually have a blog for my communications class that has like small acts of service that people can do. Yeah. So my goal is to have 10 posts by the end of the year of like different unique service things that people can do within like five minutes. I so. love that. Do you see how this works? She's going from no posts right now to 10 posts, or whatever you are right now, wherever you are, sorry, don't mean to assume anything. So you're going from however many posts you've done so far to 10 more by the end of the year. And do you see if she ex executes that, does that accomplish her why? 100% it does, right? Thank you. 100%. Thank you for sharing that. That's very powerful. This is how the rubber meets the road. This is how we deliver on our promises and deliver on who we want to be as people. It doesn't have to be huge. We don't have to solve the world's problems in one day, one month, or one year. But you can chunk this out. You can say, what's the next logical step? What's the first thing I have to do if my mountain is going to be climbed? And decide right then and there that you're going to do it and hold yourself accountable to it. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. Now, once you've got your X to Y by when, this is where we actually focus on what is most important, what we can actually do the behaviors that are going to drive that result. This is what we call lead measures. And you'll notice down here below, there are two words that drive lead measures. They are predictive, meaning they actually help your goal. This is not busy work. And they are influenceable, meaning I control them 100%. Let's go back to our example of somebody who's trying to lose weight, who has that why to be healthy in retirement. If I'm trying to lose weight, I can control two things. I can control what I eat every day. I can control that. A lead measure for me may be, you know what, today or only once a week I'm going to have any kind of baked goods or candy bars or soda. Or with every meal I'm going to have a piece of fruit or a serving of vegetables. Right? Also, I can control when and how I exercise. So three times a week I'm going to exercise. And if I hold myself accountable to those lead measures, do you think my weight's going to start falling? Yeah, and if it's not, then maybe there's, a, there's some more serious thing at hand that I know need to get checked out, right? It removes the hiding places. Let's go back to Paul O'Neill. Shortly after Paul O'Neill started at Alcoa, a circumstance arose that drove their lead measures on how they actually measured their workplace safety. So there was a young man who started at one of their plants. Uh, he was newly married. His wife was pregnant with their first child. They started at Alcoa because of the health benefits. And as all of us are, the first time you get a job, you want to impress, right? You're trying to do good work. You're trying to contribute to the team. And his first or second week on the job, the machine he was working at seized up. And the thing that he was tasked with committing or delivering by the end of the day was on halt. So as an anxious person, instead of just being lazy and saying, you know what, they'll figure it out. I'm going to the break room. I'll see what's going on. 
this individual said, I'm gonna fix, out, I'm gonna fix this. I promise I'd have this done by the end of the day. I wanna keep my promise. So he crossed some boundaries that he didn't know were there, violated some safety protocols he didn't know existed, and entered into the realm where the machine spun around and found some aluminum that had solidified within the machine. Well, that's the problem. Pulls it out and starts walking back to his station. The machine started moving again. And what do you think happens? Yeah, he ends up, he ends up getting killed in the line of duty. He ends up getting killed by virtue of not adhering or knowing what the safety policies and procedures were. The very next morning, Paul O'Neill flew all of his executives from across the country and the world into his office, and they recreated the scene. And Paul O'Neill says, we killed this young man. This is your fault, and this is my fault, and this is everybody's fault who works at Alcoa. This is never, ever going to happen again. This is, this is not consistent with our why. This is not consistent with who we are as people. This will never happen again at Alcoa while I'm the chief executive officer. So they recreated a couple of things and delivered three lead measures that were entirely in their control that they believed would finalize and eliminate this ever happening again. Number one, they repainted all the ground and railings that alerted individuals to not cross. This young man crossed a boundary that he didn't know existed, that he shouldn't have crossed because the paint had worn off years before. They repainted everything. Every single employee received a new manual, new things that they had to know for safety protocols, and the managers were tasked with, with figuring those out and making sure that everybody was up to date. And finally, he gave every employee at Alcoa his home phone number. And he said, if you ever see a violation of safety that's not dealt with immediately, you will call me immediately at my home. I don't care the hour, I don't care the day. If it's Christmas morning, you will call me and we will talk about it and we will deal with it. So those are his three lead measures. We're gonna repaint everything and make it very clear on where people should be and not be. We're gonna reissue and redo the safety procedures so there is no doubt on how to be safe at work. And finally, if there's any failure of these first two, I'm gonna be notified right away by anybody in the company who, uh, who is re I'm responsible for. And so those were the lead measures that he focused on. So now I'm gonna give you two minutes and with your X to Y by when, write down your lead measure or your lead measures that will influence your X to Y by when, that will influence your one thing. And in interest of time, I don't want to keep you too long. We won't share these things. We can talk about them after. You can always email uh, my business partner or I if you have some questions. We can talk about it afterwards. But have at it. you got two minutes to write down your lead measures, and then uh, we'll move on to the last piece. Got about one minute. All right, 10 seconds. 10 seconds, wrap up your notes, wrap up your conversations. All right, so let's bring it all back together. So at this point, you, just like Paul O'Neill at Alcoa, have identified and clarified what your one thing is. You've put that into goal format, and you've decided on your behaviors that you can control that will drive that goal. So as we move along, let me give you a word of warning. At this stage, when you set a goal and you identify what you can do to reach that goal, everything is very exciting. Everything is new and it's shiny and it's exciting to work on. Three months from now, as you're still dealing with this goal, like if we're doing our blog post, for example, 
If it's December 3rd and I'm at seven blog posts, I'm still accountable for three more. And it's much less exciting at the beginning of December than it was on October 2nd, right? Your job as a leader is to filter the noise and resist the shiny objects or good opportunities that'll come along and distract you from your one thing. Because I promise you they will come. They always do. And it's not even bad opportunities. It's not people that are legitimately trying to distract you. But there are other things that will distract you. Resist the urge to chase away your, from your one thing after something that you know is not going to produce the most meaning to you and your team long term. Right? So just a word of warning as you do that. So now let's go into the final process of execution, executing our vision. This is where accountability comes into play. You can have the best vision. You can have the most actionable goal. You can have the most predictive lead measures. But if you're not accountable to someone or something over and over and over again, then it's all for naught, and it will not produce anything. So there are a couple of different components. Number one is a scoreboard. You must keep score. Chad was telling me that in a lot of the, the classes and the things you're working on, you've learned the importance of scoreboards that prevent team dysfunction. Everybody must know where we are at all times, right? So at this point, we're assuming that everybody you're responsible for or that's working towards the goal understands the vision and is very clear about what their responsibilities are because of the lead measures. So there are a couple of components of a scoreboard that work the best. Number one, keep it simple. I should be able to look very easily and quickly at a scoreboard and know whether I'm on the right track or I'm not. Number two, make it visible. Everybody who's responsible for this goal needs to know how that's coming along and they need to be able to see this. No excuses, no hiding places, right? And number three, it needs to be updated daily with real-time information. One of the best scoreboards I've seen was actually a company I worked at in California when my wife and I lived there shortly after we were married. This company had some goals to improve process times and, uh, and to get their workers home earlier. And so they measured process times with this, with this very simple scoreboard. It was simply a green arrow, which was where we uh, want to be, that's our goal, and a red arrow, which is where we currently are from a process cycle standpoint. And there was simply a chart on the main wall as you walk in. Nobody can miss it. If a customer walked in, they'd see it. But there was a chart that says, this is where we are and this is where we want to be. And it was updated every morning to let people know where they were. So a scoreboard is paramount. We won't get into details on how you can create that. That's a very creative process. You can do however you'd like, right? So second, and this is where the most fundamental uh, ac accountability principles come into play, is through the war meeting. We call it the war meeting because it's your weekly accountability report. And you'll notice that there's an agenda for this on the back of the document that you have. So number one, a war meeting must include a partner or a team, somebody or something to whom you're accountable. Accountability doesn't work if it's just one person, right? Number two, you must have an agenda. We've given you an example that you can use for your accountability meetings, whether it's a team or just yourself talking with somebody else. Also, this meeting must be focused. This meeting is not for anything else that can come up. You, we know if you're working, if you're in school, if you're working on a certain goal, there are all different kinds of things that apply to you that you're responsible for. But this meeting is only for your one thing. It's not for anything else besides that one thing. So keep it focused. And finally, make it sacred. We recommend keeping this on the same time of the week every week. Nobody misses. If you're responsible for this goal, you're there. If you're, if you're traveling for work, you're calling in on the phone. If you have a meeting that's running late, then you shut that meeting down and you get to this meeting to report on your results, right? It's important that you're there. It's important that you're contributing to the team and that you're discussing if the lead measures are actually accounting for the goals, right? So here we are. In that last section, we're not going to take time to it now because I don't want to keep you too long. In that last section, you can write down the name of an accountability partner or somebody you're going to work with on your one thing goal. That's somebody you'll be accountable to. You can set up a time. My dad and I, when we work on it together, we have a time on Sunday evening. It's in our, both of our calendars, and it's sacred. We don't miss it. That's where it is, and we're going to do it. So let me finish the story of Paul O'Neill, who put these processes together in an effort to become the safest place to work in America. So by the time Paul O'Neill retired, I told you that that analyst had said the worst advice he ever gave was to sell Alcoa stock, right? Here's why. By the time Paul O'Neill retired, Alcoa profitability 
had increased, right? It had increased 500% from the day he took over, right? That's what he's hired to do as a CEO, deliver results, right? All you finance majors know that. You've got to make money. So that's his job. Additionally, if you had $1 million of Alcoa stock on, in 1987, and you held on to that stock until Paul O'Neill retired, you would have earned $1 million in dividends. You still own the stock, we just earn it in dividends. They're paying you to own that stock. And if you sold the stock the day you retired, you would receive $5 million for the sale. Now that's all well and good. The board of directors is happy. Alcoa investors are happy. The analysts are happy. But what about Paul O'Neill? His one thing wasn't to increase profitability, right? It was to make Alcoa the safest place to work in America, to go for zero injuries. So again, that day he started, 1.86 lost worker days per 100 people. By the time he retired, that never got down to zero, but it got down to 0 0.2 lost worker days per 100. Even after he retired, 10 years later, that number continued to fall down to 0.125%. Notice how, because he focused on safety, profitability didn't suffer. That's a common misnomer, right? If we have the determination and discipline to focus on our one thing, then you know, what about profitability? It'll take care of itself if you've chosen the right goals. So think of it this way. If you're trying to determine at this point whether or not Paul O'Neill was successful to become the safest place to work in America, in the year 2010, you are more likely to get injured in the workplace as a tax accountant, as an animator for Disney, or as an attorney and paralegal than you were handling molten hot aluminum at any of Alcoa's worldwide plants. Think about that for a second. Is that a man who accomplished his one thing? Absolutely, and then some. And you think about the results he drove from a dollars and cents standpoint. You think about the lives he helped of those workers who no longer miss work or, for, or have permanent disabilities because of workplace injuries. That's the task of leadership, right? You're here to make the world a better place. By clarifying your vision and by executing your vision, that's how leaders become successful. And that's how you make a difference in the world. Thanks very much for letting me be with you today.